sorry, I was talking away. Um, I know you said not to, I can't do next week. And I know you asked like, not like me and Matt to volunteer specifically, but the week after, I think is the 23rd, uh, maybe we could maybe we could go through our Dryad data submission and talk through that. That's a cool idea. That's a cool idea. Well, let's talk about that tomorrow morning when we meet. And I actually have a pestering email of some other little thing that I forgot to do on the Dryad submission. We submitted a, if you guys don't know what Dryad is, it's a um, open data platform. It's kind of nice because if you, if you have a data set and you've published a paper, you can... Um, you can um, submit your data to also be open. It's not always possible to make um, data in a data set open with a with a manuscript. But the nice thing about Dryad is it's made just for data and reproducibility. So you can upload, people don't often do it, I, I notice, but they sometimes do upload R scripts. I have even seen Python scripts, but mostly R if they have the scripts and, um, the data sets with lots of metadata. And it, it probably is stuff that um, these people want to use for teaching or they want to put it out there for ethical reasons to um, to uh, for people to calculate their own effect sizes. Uh, or um, it may be for the, the basest of human reasons, they just want an extra line on their CV. I don't know what it is. All of those are valid reasons. But yeah, that's a good idea. Let's make that happen. I don't have anything else. Are you ready to go, Joe? Ready to go. All right. I uh, will hand it over to you. We're already recording, so I'm looking forward to this. Get the old screen shared. So, can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, although actually I think everybody here probably does know me, um, I'm Joe Roberts, I'm one of the entomology lecturers here. I dabble in R uh, and a little bit of data science with, with Ed, and I semi-volunteered to give a short introduction to building a website using R and a package called Distill. Um, this is very much introductory. There is a lot more to this and a lot more complexity to this that we don't have time to cover um, in this hour. So we're going to just scratch the surface on uh, building a website. And hopefully uh, it will inspire you enough to go off and have a look at um, making slightly uh, more complex uh, websites. So I've got a couple of slides to run through. But the majority of um, this session will be me running through um, building a website from scratch and then showing you how you can deploy it um, really easily. Um, hopefully you'll decide to code along uh, with me because if you do that, you'll have the bare bones of a website um, by the end of this of this session. So you may be asking yourself, why does a scientist need a website? And the honest answer is you don't have to have one to um, have a successful career in science. However, given that, uh, you know, the majority of things are online nowadays, uh, it makes perfect sense to have your own website as well as um, some kind of social media platform. Uh, I'm a big fan personally of Twitter uh, and I make a lot of use of Twitter uh, for my career. But I also think it is worthwhile having a, uh, a website, particularly if you're an early career researcher, because it makes you findable. And the more findable you are, you'll find that more opportunities are presented to you. So you'll be invited to uh, perhaps do peer review uh, of manuscripts. Um, you may get headhunted for a particular position for a postdoc or a lectureship somewhere. Um, so having a big online presence and having your own website as a way to uh, sort of locate yourself is a good thing in my opinion. Now, alongside that, uh, it's a great place to showcase your skills, and these can be uh, your coding skills in R, but they could also be just a way of you know hosting a CV online um, that demonstrates some of your skills. You can show you know the broad spectrum of things that you're able to do 
both in the laboratory or uh, more desk based. So it makes you employable, basically. Uh, you can turn them into a blog so you can have a section on your website that's basically a, a blog and this becomes a mouthpiece for turning um, non publishable data sets. So perhaps you don't have enough data to have a peer reviewed manuscript, but you could turn it into a perspective or an opinion piece um, and host them on your own website. So you can do something with that data that uh, you realistically are never going to collect any more to augment it, but you can do something with it. And there's no uh, no real issues with doing that, not having it peer reviewed. Obviously, the caveat is that it isn't peer reviewed, but um, a really nice example of a good way to communicate science using data that you're not going to publish is to look at uh, one of my ex colleagues, Simon Leather's blog, um, because he did a fantastic job of turning old data into novel and interesting blog posts. Now, the caveat to all of this is that if you are going to have a website, you need to make sure that it is updated. If it isn't kept up to date, there's no point having it because uh, out of date information or a website is probably worse for not having one because it in, in essence shows that you uh, don't uh, don't necessarily care about it. So if you do have one, keep it updated. Now, in terms of creating a website, there are lots of point and click options available on the web, and you know most of them are very, very good. However, as people people who are in this group, um, you know, I would guess that you have some kind of interest in R programming, coding, whatever. So it would make more sense to create your own website using these platforms because you are able to implement code directly on the uh, on the website and uh, you can create very nice looking websites using relatively uh, small chunks of code. Now for our users, there are in essence two main packages available uh, to you to create a, a website. The first one is Blogdown and the second one is the one that we're going to focus on, Distill. Blogdown is good and I used to be an advocate of it, However, it's become unnecessarily complicated and um, not very user friendly, whereas Distill is more streamlined and actually serves a more than appropriate function for what we want to do, which is basically have a small online space to uh, showcase skills, a bit about us, how to contact us. So uh, we're going to look at Distill uh, today and the beauty of Distill is that it requires very little setup and it's very easy to uh, to host online. So what is Distill? Uh, it's basically uh, a package that extends R Markdown documents. So hopefully you're all relatively familiar with R Markdown. If you're not, we will look at it a little bit um, when we do a bit of live coding, but that isn't the predominant um, thing we're going to focus on uh, today. However, there are lots of great resources out there to learn R Markdown. Just go to the R Studio website. They have a whole host of them uh, there. And Distill basically just uh, allows you to um, create an, an output. So some HTML web pages that are optimized for scientific and technical communication. And that's because these R Markdown documents allow you to have coding. You can have equations, pictures, plots, whatever you want to have tables and it is a really nice simple way of getting your information online. There are some resources at the end of these slides and <clears throat> I'm more than happy to share these slides to pe with people at the end um, but basically it's just links to the distilled documentation, uh, the R markdown documentation and then something called Netlify drop which we will look at um, uh, at the end of the session. So are there any questions about that so far? It's a pretty brief introduction to um, um, what it is. Uh, hopefully there's nothing too complicated there, um, but nothing too uh, intimidating, but we will see uh, the, intri uh, the intricate details of how it works uh, in a second. Any questions? I'll take silence as a no. Looks good so far. Let me just uh, reiterate in my own words what you said. Distill is a system to organize uh, Markdown and HTML output. 
Of course, you have our yeah, markdown we talked about a lot in here. And Netlify is a way to uh, host the website uh, itself. So it's those three components working together. Exactly, yeah. And we're going to go through each of those components now, uh, live coding. So we'll, we'll see how they work, basically. OK, so let me unshare the slides. And like I said, I'm happy to, to share those slides if uh, if people are interested. So hopefully you can see this. I might zoom in just a little bit. Is that a reasonable size? Just a thumbs up in the chat will be fine. Can't gauge how big it is. Or if it needs to be bigger. Thumbs up. OK, good. Right, so to create a um, <clears throat> the still uh, web page, basically you need to have, make sure that you have distill installed first. So you'll need to install the package uh, either by typing install.packages and then distill, or you can go uh, install it from the drop down menu here and it's just distill. I'm not going to run it because I've already got it installed on my computer, but uh, if you want to follow along, uh, I'll give you 30 seconds just to install that um, before we move on. Just out of interest, thumbs up. Is anybody going to be following along with this or are you going to just watch? OK, so a few people will be following along. OK, that's good. OK, so to initiate a distill uh, website, you basically need to go to file. Um, and then you'll need to select new project. This will give you the option. Well, it will bring up the new project wizard to start with um, to choose either a new directory, existing directory or version control. Uh, if I was doing this myself, I would pick version control uh, so that I can keep it updated using Git. But for the purposes of today, we are going to select a new directory. You'll be presented with potentially a, a screen that looks slightly different to this. It depends on what packages you've already got installed. Um, if you scroll down, you'll see somewhere, hopefully, once you've got the distill package installed, an option for a distill website. Ignore the distill blog. That basically allows you to generate a single page um, uh, HTML uh, page, which is fine if you only have one page you want to display, but I'm going to assume that we want to create a slightly more complex website with multiple HTML pages. So if we click on distill website, you'll be presented with uh, this sort of series of options. So directory name, um, I don't have a directory. Remember, we started a new project. I believe this is being saved straight to my documents, but I'm going to save it to my R projects folder. And then I'm just going to call it um, Harug. Uh, And again, uh, you can call this whatever you want. It doesn't have to mirror the directory name, so we'll just call it uh, Harrog website. You'll see there's an option to configure your distill website for GitHub pages. Now, GitHub pages, if you're unfamiliar with it, is um, the GitHub branded version of Netlify to a certain extent. And if you want to host your distill website on GitHub pages, then uh, the configuration is slightly uh, different. And actually, I think it's unnecessarily complicated. By far, the easiest way to deploy a website from R is to use Netlify Drop. And we'll look at that um, when we get to the end of this uh, end of this uh, session. So you can ignore the configure uh, for GitHub pages. And then all you need to do is create a project. And it'll do some stuff, hopefully. Here we are. OK, good. Right. So what you'll notice is that um, our studio basically refreshed itself because we've opened up a new new project and we've been presented with three new um, files here, two of which are our markdown files 
and one of which is a YAML um, file. Now the two markdown files are basically what we are going to edit. The YAML file basically contains uh, lots of configuration information about your website. So if you want to make particular changes to your website, this is in essence what you would uh, be changing. So before we move on, we can actually look to see what the basic um, website that will be created from this looks like. So if we go to the top of the uh, menus at the top here and we just click build, then build all, it will generate hopefully um, an example of what the website looks like. So we've made no edits to this website so far. This is um, a standard uh, template that is created. Now the only difference is that obviously it says Harrow website because that's custom from when we created the uh, created the file. So if you look at the files we created, index.rmd, that is basically your homepage, so the landing page that you first see. And you can see here that the title, sorry, lost it, there we are. The title here is Harrog website is mirrored here. The welcome to the website, I hope you enjoy it, is the subheading here or the description. And uh, there's nothing else here, basically. Now these are all clickable. So home will take you back to here, as does the Harrog website. However, if you click about, that takes you to a second page that has some different information that you can't see here. And that's because uh, this information is basically in a second R Markdown file. So all of the different pages on your website will require a separate R Markdown file. So every page equals one R Markdown file. And what the distill package does is basically takes those individual our markdown files and puts them into a directory that generates HTML outputs and tells them how you're going to uh, be able to link between those different files so that you have a uh, website that you can navigate by clicking through to different links. So if I click on the Harrow website, it will take me back to uh, the beginning. So I'm just going to minimize that for the time being, and then I'm going to go back to the index dot RMD file. So that's the the landing page, if you like. I'm going to pause here for a second to see if there is any questions about what I've done so far. We've done nothing in terms of creating any content or actually any coding. We've just uh, set up our template for the for the website that we're going to work from. Any questions so far? No, but it's really good. It's very slick and very easy. If I can do yeah. this, I can tell people how to do it, then it's easy. Right, OK, so if there's no questions, we'll just persevere through. Now, the beauty of R Markdown is that you can basically code in R. You can create figures, uh, import tables, whatever you want to do, and display it uh, within these documents. So it's very easy to do. Now there's obviously lots of uh, detail in terms of how our markdown works and this uh, session really isn't about learning how to use our markdown effectively. So we will gloss over some uh, of the basic details around our markdown. But if there is something that you're not quite sure what I'm doing or how I've done it, you know, just stick your hand up and I'll answer the question uh, uh, if you have one. So Basically, all you need to do to add content to your website is type. So you could say. Um, now to change this and make it display in our sort of preview, if you like, you just need to save it and it should automatically re-render. It hasn't. That's fine. So all we need to do in that instance is go to the top and uh, refresh it by clicking install and restart. And it should refresh. I suspect it isn't refreshing because uh, the computer's working overtime. There we are. So now you can see, see that the extra text that we just added 
is there. And you'll notice that uh, I've not added any hashtags or anything to that text because in an R markdown file, you can essentially type as if it is a Word document uh, to a certain extent. And actually the code chunks themselves are the bits that go in special um, special areas. So you can see an example of one here. So in order to specify that you're working in R code, you have these three little check things and then uh, some curly brackets and then you have to specify that you're working in R and you have more of them uh, down here as well. And that dignify or signifies that it's a, uh, a code chunk and you can basically work as if you are typing in an R script in that section. Now, if we go back to this um, preview, that hello, my name is Joe and I love insects bit of text is fine, uh, but it's not very stand out and it's pretty bland looking. So you can instead add some extra details. So we can use hashtags um, in this section to add um, titles. So you'll notice that this now has gone a greenish color and that's because uh, we signified that it's going to be a title. Now you can add a number of uh, hashtags to this to change uh, the level of the title. So you can even make it a, a main heading or a subheading, that kind of thing. But we're going to leave it as uh, this one. So I hope that this is going to change. There we are. So you can see now we've got an introduction. So this could be uh, a way of adding uh, some sort of segments to your web page or your landing page. And if you want to add things like, um, um, I don't know, let's say we want to add some text, or no, not text, sorry, a, a figure to our plot. So let's um, let's change this to make it uh, representative. So uh, I love graphs as an example. OK, so that's fine. So we now want to add a second piece of uh, information to this. So I've added another heading uh, plotting. And if we want to actually create a plot um, in here, we need to add some information to say that we are going to be um, creating a plot. So we'll specify that we're working in, in R. And uh, I'm just going to specify some pieces of information here that are looking at um, how we can set up this particular piece of code that we're going to uh, do here. So this is all about looking at or defining the boundaries of how we are um, going to let our plot uh, look like when we're when we're finished. So. You don't need to worry a huge amount about what I'm doing here. This is just for demonstration purposes uh, in terms of. Um, making sure that the figures look. Right. So that piece of information is basically saying that I, I want my uh, figure that I'm going to create to be the um, width of the body of text and it can go outside of that boundary if it needs to and then I'm specifying the width of the figure manually so it'll be six um, six centimeters wide and 1.5 centimeters high. So because we're working in R code here we can basically just work as if uh, we were normally plotting uh, some data. So I'm just going to use as an example some of the uh, one of the data sets that's already built into ggplot, uh, which is the uh, the diamond data set. I'm just going to plot uh, carrot against price as a And don't worry about this too much. This isn't important. It's just to show you how you uh, create a 
a plot. So if I run that code, hopefully it's going to create. An output for us, so it's created this very uh, bland looking um, line graph, a uh, small smooth line graph, I should say. So it has the carrot of the diamonds there and then the price on the uh, Y axis. Now. That hasn't updated onto the website automatically because I haven't uh, run the entire thing. So I just ran a single uh, code chunk there. So you can do this to preview what you're producing to make sure the code works before you uh, before you execute it. So if I save that now, it will rerun the entire distill um, build. Automatically, hopefully with zero errors. There we are. And uh, you can see that I've added uh, that figure to uh, to the web page. Now you could say, well, OK, that's fine, but you need more information. So um, we are going to use the. Diamond. Data set. You can add a bit of context to it um, so that uh, people know what you're talking about. But you'll notice that the code itself isn't included on to the actual um, the actual uh, website. You can include it uh, if you really wish. Um, you know, it, it is entirely possible to in, to include that uh, code. Um, so you could. Um, Specify that you want to include the code directly by putting the echo equals true option in there. So that will um, basically allow you to include that code chunk in your uh, web page. So if you want to demonstrate that you know how to code these things, so these can look just like images, uh, it is possible to include include the code chunks as well. So uh, you can see that you can create that nice looking. Um, uh, layout of code on here and it's interactive as well, which is quite good. So what we need to do now is actually I should say actually before we move on that if you want to include the code, but not the output for whatever reason, you can do that by uh, adding eval equals false. So if I save that again, uh, hopefully what we'll get is just the code without the, the output. If you just want to demonstrate you know how to use the code or even build your own code bank for whatever reason online, you could do it uh, you doing uh, this way. So we could just to demonstrate subheadings, uh, add another hashtag to the plotting title to make it um, a little bit smaller. So basically anything you can think of doing in R, you can replicate on a distill uh, web page very easily. And you'll notice that uh, we have had done nothing to the about um, page while we've been doing this because we're only editing this one uh, one markdown file here to make any changes on additional uh, pages you need to edit that specific um, markdown file directly. That's very, very basic um, sort of introduction to creating content for your uh, for your website. You can clearly go into a lot more detail uh, with this and you know add all sorts of things like tables and um, pictures if you wish. Um, but my Thoughts would be you want to keep your landing page relatively simple, you know, perhaps an introductory sentence or paragraph about yourself and then link through onto other markdown uh, files to uh, expand on your on your interests. 
So before I move on, I'm just going to do a quick. Uh, um, quick check on are there any questions? Sorry, I missed your uh, comment, George, about posting the uh, code in. I had uh, the chat in the background. Are there any questions on? Oh, yes, yeah, so, uh, Magda, yeah, go for it. Hi, Joe. Um, a quick question about um, how, uh, you know, the um, uh, intellectual property and stuff like this. If we publish a graph or a piece of data on our website, can we publish it later on in an in a paper? Because I know that sometimes it is tricky. I'm not very familiar with it. Maybe you could just explain how it really works. Thank you. Uh, that's an interesting question, and um, Ed may also want to jump in with his uh, opinion on this because he's been doing uh, science for a lot longer than I have. Uh, well, certainly publishing science longer than I have. But my understanding is that it would probably be on a journal by journal basis. Um, the sorts of data that I'm suggesting that you may want to include on your own website probably would be data sets that are never going to be fully completed. So perhaps you've got some data whereby you've run out of funding or whatever, and you're not going to uh, try to get more money to, to to bulk out that data set. You only have a year's worth of data instead of three for a, for a field trial, for example. You might be able to gain some insight just from that one year without making definitive conclusions, and it may be interesting enough for you to write a blog post about it. That's the sort of data I'm suggesting. If you had a uh, you know a proper project uh, that you anticipated that you were going to publish, I would probably withhold that data and not do anything with it in terms of putting it onto your own website. You also have to be careful about uh, hosting PDFs of papers on your own website. Even if you're the author, you can't distribute them uh, necessarily freely on your own website. So what I would suggest is that you um, host PDFs of the unformatted um, accepted manuscripts as they would look as if you were writing them in a Word document, for example, because the thing that the journals own is technically the formatting rather than the content. So you can do that and get around those those, those sort of restrictions um, that way. I mean, there are exceptions to that if it's an open access um, journal like uh, Plos One or something like that. You can redistribute the PDFs as you see fit. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, many thanks. OK, good. OK, so any questions about uh, what I've demonstrated here on this? Um, on this uh, on this landing page. No, OK, good. So what do we want to do if we have more than one page? So the basic. Um, template for a distill website is in essence formed from two uh, markdown files. What if you want to expand that? Well, you can expand it. So what you'll need to do is um, basically create a new markdown file. So just go to file, new file, our markdown. Don't worry about giving it a title um, or filling in the author detail. Make sure HTML is selected and push OK. That will create a untitled markdown file. Now, that doesn't quite match what you need. So what I would suggest is that you just delete the entire section of inf uh, information. You then copy the information from one of your other distill pages and um, save it here. So what I would then do is save this and you want to give it um, the title of whatever tab you want to uh, replace it with. So as an example up here, you might want to have another tab that says something along the lines of um, graph portfolio. So you could call this graph portfolio. And the naming of these files is really important because it in essence allows Distill to know which file is looking for when it's building the website. So save that. Um, the title, we can change that to then graph portfolio. The description.
Now, when I save that, it is not going to do anything. So, well, for a number of reasons. One, I didn't say knit on save. So if I check that, it will rebuild the website. So once this is built, it will create this one page that says graph portfolio. And if I click home, it basically won't take me anywhere but there. So that thinks that is the home page. So what you need to do is click out of that, go to your YAML, and you need to add some extra information. So this basically contains lots of information about your uh, website. So the name is the one that we created initially. That's just the title of it, and it's a description. Don't ever change the output directory because this is where all of your HTML files are saved. If you change that, you are um, going to break the website basically. And then we have an option called navbar. So navbar corresponds to just uh, bring it back up. Got a question in the chat and a hand up, Joe. Oh, right. Okay. I don't know why they're not showing on my uh, screen. So one uh, is uh, Claire has asked, uh, can you show how to open the new um, RMD tab, please? Oh, right. Yeah, of course. So in order to open a new RMD tab, uh, Claire, go to file in the top, new file, R markdown. Don't need to change any of the settings. Just keep it as HTML and then push OK. Once you are presented with that new R markdown file, select all of the existing information and basically delete it. You'll then need to go to one of your other existing ones. I suggest taking the, the about one because it's one that's uh, pre uh, set. Copying the, the YAML from the top of that. So these are the information between these checks and then the initial code chunk and just pasting it in. You can then save that as whatever it is you want to save it as. So whatever you decide to, to do with this particular page. For example, this one I've decided to call it a graph portfolio because that's what I'm working from. Is that OK? Does that answer the question? Yep. And then Magda, you got your hand up. Is that a residual hand from previous? Of course, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, no problem. OK, so I'm just going to close that untitled one because I don't need that. Um, so. Going back to. Um, the page here, so even though we've created this graph portfolio uh, markdown file, there's no way to navigate to it. We don't have an extra tab at the top here that says graph portfolio. So to address that in your YAML, you go to the, the nav bar, which is basically that navigation bar is this section across the top here. And we add some extra information. So we need to add some text. So the text is what will be displayed at the top. And this is between quotation marks. So graph portfolio. And then we have to add a HTML uh, reference, which is a href. So this is basically telling um, distill which of the HTML files you generate from your R markdown corresponds to that um, that particular piece of text. So we've called it um, graph portfolio dot uh, RMD. So instead of dot RMD, because we want to display the HTML file, we call it HTML. Now, if we save that, And then save that. What I'm hoping will happen is that this will refresh with a new tab at the top that says graph portfolio. So that is then our uh, our graph portfolio, and we can click and navigate between the uh, the different components. So that's how you create extra pages um, for your for your distill website and uh, there is lots you can do with um, with these different pages as I've already shown with the the graphs and the the R markdown text. The world is basically your oyster 
in terms of uh, creating a, a website. Now, what I would say is that you have to have some caution in terms of how many tabs you generate. You don't want a huge number of tabs and a huge number of um, web pages for this particular package because it does become quite cumbersome in terms of generating um, generating that um, that website. It can become quite slow. But you can produce a reasonably uh, reasonably large uh, website based on this uh, this particular framework. So, are there any questions on uh, what we've done up until this point? So, I've given you the basic framework to create a uh, a very basic website for um, for yourselves using the distill package and our markdown. Any questions? It will take a little bit of reading around the documentation to, to find the some of the nitty gritty details, I suspect, but I'm always happy to do a follow up session if people want it. Have you got like an example of like one of the best distilled websites that you've seen? Uh, have I got an example? Yes. If you give me two seconds. I will find one. And with regards to like the URL, when yeah. I put this in my browser, the URL was my own like documents. So yeah. how do you like share it? Do you know what I mean? That's we're going to move on to that in a second. Oh, sorry. All the way you said it, I thought you were wrapping up. No, no, I'm not wrapping up. No, no. I'm going to show you how to wrap. I'm just I was I was getting questions on the detail of actually creating it. I have a I have one question about that before we move on, Joe. Oh, yeah, sure. Is um, my my workflow for um, for the Herrig website is uh, making a default GitHub website. Part of that workflow is um, is to compile the HTML locally and then push that pre-compiled HTML to GitHub, which displays it just about properly almost all the time. Yeah. And then my workflow for the bootcamp website is different. Um, I was inspired by a similar talk to this that you gave, you know, now two and a half years ago, who who can uh, keep track of the time? And uh, what the workflow there is, I suspect, is the same as here. You, you've been compiling locally just for the uh, sake of um, looking at your work and doing error checking. But but when you uh, th this is a big advantage, I think, to um, to uh, Netlify is that um, it compiles everything with its own tools and you never have to sully your hands with compiling it locally. So it's also less information that you have to store on on um, wherever you store it. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, I've chosen to do it this way today and my own website is done exactly the way you've just described um, because I wasn't sure what the level of Git uh, was in this group. So I thought I would avoid it where possible. Yeah, good call. Um, George, you asked me about a good website for uh, Distill. So I think as an example, let me see if I can get this. Good example of a um, this still website is find one. Is actually it might even be just the straight documentation for um, for the actual uh, package. So. A, a classic example uh, is that the documentation for distill is made using distill, as you would hope. Otherwise, uh, uh, there'd be something quite wrong with that. But um, this is a kind of thing that you can, you know, build um, for your for yourself in essence. Now, obviously, this is more of a technical document rather than a personal uh, web page, but um, the actual distill itself is born from a journal i think called to distill which posts lots of um peer-reviewed papers and 
commentary on a variety of topics in um, in R. Um, and I quite like this one because it's more of a blog type page in but you just have a continuous stream of articles that you can scroll through. Um, but obviously it has um, more information about uh, it as well on the different pages. And this is quite nice because it demonstrates that you can actually have interactive plots and GIFs and things like that um, as well. Ed has shared another link for him from what he likes. So this is the mock-up. I think this is Thomas Mock, maybe. Yeah, this, Tom, yeah. Thomas Mock's uh, one. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, Ed, Tom Mock. Yeah. It's very you. That website's very you. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of joking in the chat. It's mostly the font I like. Yeah, I was going to say this is yeah. like your uh, go-to font, isn't it? Probably. Yeah. So this is the sort of thing you can make. You can basically make anything you want. Uh, it's very customizable with a bit of effort. Now, in terms of going full customization, uh, there are some pre uh, installed themes in Distill. They're all terrible except the default. If you really want to um, customize its appearance, you will need to do a little bit of or learn a little bit of CSS or find someone who's already got a theme you like and implement their CSS on your uh, on your blog. But that's a little bit out of the scope for uh, what, what we're doing. Um, today. So the other questions that I've had were to do with uh, how we deploy um, these. So if you go just Google Netlify drop, you will be met with um, this interface here. Now, to permanently host your website on Netlify, you will need an account. Whatever you host or just drop into here today without being logged in uh, will disappear within one hour. And uh, the beauty of this is that it's very, very easy to upload your site. So all you need to do in order to um, upload your site is if you go to um, your R Studio and you look at the directory where you have your different files associated with this project, you look for the underscore site folder that's basically the only folder you need to worry about in terms of uploading it. So I'm just going to save everything just to make sure it's all um, up to date. OK. Yeah, that's fine. So I can close that. So my I'm just going to do one final check. I'm paranoid that it's not going to render properly. Um, all we need to do then is go to this page here. And when this is done, close that. So if we go, oops, this page here, um, open up our folder where we have saved this. So I know that I've saved this in my R projects folder. It was called Harrow website demo. And then you can see all these files that we have from um, from our studio are here. And this underscore site folder is the one that we we want. So we just drag it into this uh, section here. It will upload. Something went wrong, which is promising. What has gone wrong? For me, my ad blocker is giving me trouble. <clears throat> mm. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why that's not working. Got a feeling it might be because it's open in our studio. Yeah, OK, so don't open. I uh, don't have it open your project open in our studio, basically. So once you've dropped that underscore site folder into the uh, box that it uh, indicates, you'll see that your site is live. Now it says here that this is an unclaimed site. That's because we're not logged in. We don't have an account, but um, 
if you were, that would be permanently uh, hosted there. It gives you a link here and it's not very, um, very pretty um, URL, but you can edit that URL if you have a, a, a site. So if you click on that, it will take you through to your site and that is that is it. So that's live. So you could copy that. Into the chat. And you could go and visit that for the next hour uh, and it will be there. And it has all the functionality uh, that we saw in our studio. So it's incredibly easy <coughs> to uh, generate that website and then upload it. Obviously, the downside to this method. Is that any time you make a change to your website, you have to um, re re um, remake it, then re upload it manually. So there is some advantage to investing time into using Git and uh, GitHub to automatically uh, generate this every time you save it from our studio. But as an introductory way to create a very basic website, uh, uploading it manually via Netlify drop is is clearly very, uh, very simple to do. So that's pretty much all if, I've got if, for you, Ed. Oh, George, sorry. go for it. If you have, um, if you logged in and you made an account, is it all free? Because obviously that, that Padlock, if you if when you actually do a website via WordPress, the padlock costs you like costs you some money. So is it just is it all free? Yeah, it's free. Well, it's free to a certain extent. So uh, for the average user, it's free. Having a secure website is also free. Doing things like having a really custom um, URL. So if I wanted JoeRoberts.com, I would have to buy that domain from wherever. Um, but in Netlify, it would be free to host a custom URL, for example. So for the vast majority of users, the, all of the basic functionality that you want to have a nice looking professional website is free. That's really good. We don't want to hear about what's free, Joe. We want to hear about what we can pay for. <laughs> I'm not in the business of selling things. <laughs> Well, are there are there for like a pro account or something? What what would the advantage be? Uh, for Netlify. Yeah, is there such a thing? I mean, I, I'm just curious. Yeah, so Netlify uh, does offer a paid tier, and the paid tier, from my understanding, and I don't know this completely because I've never done it because I don't have any need to do it, is uh, designed for um, um, corporations with high volumes of traffic, for example. So if you have a um, uh, if you have a website that you know is being visited on a on a really frequent basis, then you may want to um, to to sign up for that because you're going to um, you're going to obviously have a lot more traffic and they're going to start restricting the uh, the number of people that can visit at any one time. But uh, I think the real advantages for um, the paid services is that they basically offer more support to you. So if you're having issues deploying websites for whatever reason, you get some obscure error message. They provide support to you to, to get that fixed. Whereas if you're on the free tier, they don't care basically. Got you. So it's basically like uh, speed and um, and support, technical support, if you have customers waiting to pay you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. And actually, I think as well with the paid version of Netlify, you can host uh, secure uh, like web stores and payment services, I think as well, which I don't think you can do through the, through the free tier. Um, Matt, a uh, question about friendly, yeah, friendly URL. You need to have, um, well, you need to be logged in and have an account basically, but yeah, you can edit the URL um, to a certain extent um, from that one, so you can create uh, a, a nicer URL. If you want that truly custom URL, totally possible to do it, but you have to pay obviously the domain provider uh, for it. Any URL that is um, uh, created through the Netlify, I should point out, will always have .netlify .app at the end. So I could probably have joeroberts.netlify .app, provided that nobody else had it. I'm sure that nobody does because it's a pretty bland name. So I'm sure I, can, I'm sure I could secure that one. Uh, but yeah, it's a bit like GitHub. Uh, it always has their um, uh, their own sort of mark over the um, over the URLs. Netlify does something very similar. So that's all I've got for you, Ed. I don't know if that was OK. It was a bit of a crash course, and I'm happy to do more advanced stuff if people get really into it. 
think that's great. Uh, you mentioned, well, I didn't know about Netlify Drop. You know, I can't keep up with all this fancy new stuff that people are into. And um, yeah, it's cool. I understand it now. I didn't quite understand it before. Um, it is for a small website, I think, uh, just to talk to you a second about it. It seems like um, if you had to upload everything every time, um, that's okay if it's small. But if you did have a blog and you kept it up and you had pictures, and I think uh, if if ever I had to wait like more than a couple of seconds, I'd probably lose patience and go <laughs> GitHub. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. And you know, implementing it in GitHub is short-term pain for long-term game. Uh, yeah. So if you were seriously into blogging and you were doing like a blog a week or a, whatever, even maybe a blog a month, maybe you would probably invest the time to to implement um, a, a GitHub workflow. Yeah, I mean, uh, but dragging and dropping, yeah, that's. I'm pretty impressed that you don't even need an account to showcase your site. That's uh, it's super cool. Yeah. Uh, it's too much, and we're out of time. But uh, I am curious about how to change the aesthetics like um you, you know it's another trick that you showed me before that uh, i used a long time ago and then since i haven't used it and i, I as you said short-term pain i haven't yeah. thought about i thought about it i have to learn it all from scratch again but it was setting up the um theme for um for the hugo uh style theme for the for the boot camp but um i there must be some tricks like this in extent in distill yeah, no, yeah, there, there is. There are lots of tricks for it in Distill, and I think Distill is slowly overtaking Lockdown and Hugo as a, as a framework because it's so easy. I see all the cool people are talking about Distill now, and um, nobody's talking about Blockdown, so I'm, I'm sure you're right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Finally, I've made it to the cool people. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Joe. I think that was really cool. I hope no, you're some welcome. people. Um, We'll use this. I hope a lot of people coded along because um, it was, uh, yeah, super straightforward. Really nice. Really nice. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Can I ask another question? Sorry. No, oh, time's out. Sorry, George. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course you can. Last week or one of the weeks, I did the CSS, the CSS style and embedded it into an R markdown. Do you think that would work? On um, yeah, it would work. Obviously. I think that you would probably need to embed that in the YAML file rather than a uh, markdown because it's, I mean, presumably you want it to be site-wide uh, in terms of the yeah, start. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so there would be a way of doing it um, through the through the YAML off the top of my head. I can't remember exactly how you do it, uh, but it, it is definitely possible. I think it's probably on the, I would, I would imagine it's in the documentation. Yeah, There's, I don't know. Uh, Thank you. Be easy to do a small experiment to check that. But um, a thing that I would say is that I've I've gotten into what's probably a terrible habit with my own markdown practice and R markdown practice is that um be, because I use R to compile in my current workflow, um, I insert HTML uh, with markdown. And I've gotten pretty crazy and woolly with it. And now it's all just one language to me. I, I just do it natively. There's some markdown uh, native stuff, some R markdown stuff, and some HTML. Just I occasionally hit a problem. But a, a thing to be aware with, of with the, um, with the Netlify system is that, um, <clears throat> that uh, there's some magic, some automation that goes on to, to translate your markdown to some format that um, is going to be converted to HTML. That's that's a benefit if you're not a professional programmer. But if you try to do something clever on the background back end and push it through, I suspect that especially with CSS, that would cause some problems. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I was just looking through. Uh, I'll just reshare it. My screen. If, if people have time to do this. I mean, I've got all the time in the world to so. say. <laughs> uh pinging basically is um is in essence css in this and you specify it in your uh in your yaml by just adding theme and theme.css so you just drop your css file into your folder where your website is and hopefully it should pick it up it looks like 
Um, so there are some example was well, an example here, um, and it gives you the CSS that underlies that particular. I mean, that's not an improvement in my opinion on the actual default theme, but it is possible to do. I think what you're uh, proposing, George. Okay, yeah, I'm going to shut you. down the video now. Thank you so much again. That was uh, excellent. I think that um, I'll just remind.